Hello, everybody. We are doing a special podcast today, or a podcast series. First time we've done anything like this, we're going to be discussing a book series. This may be the only time we do this. Maybe there'll be some other book we all read and really enjoy and want to do it later. But for these next couple off-week podcasts, we're going to be talking about the Three Body Problem series, or trilogy, I guess, of, of books which is a fantastic sci-fi series that we all three have enjoyed. I only read this because I thought we were doing a book club. <laughs> That's Matt. And then Orion's here also. Hello. And yeah, I guess it's become kind of a book club now. It was like an ad hoc book club because I read it, Amber and I read it first, and then you got in pretty quickly. Is that right, Orion? Yeah, I think I started before you finished it. But I also read faster than you and read the like the second and third one in a period of 26 hours or something. Oh, so. yeah, that's right. You finished before I did. I'm a okay. slow reader. Yeah. And I then think... at some point we lent them over to Matt because we kept talking about these books. Yeah. 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 We kind of like we have different thresholds for being convinced to read something. Right. I, def- I have the highest threshold, but you wore me down and yeah. I'm very happy that that happened. So would you say it was more a wearing down of your threshold or a building up of the book? Um, I, I think the building up of the book would be more accurate. This is a book series that we were just talking about this before the podcast, I think is benefited by not knowing much about it going in. When I heard of the books, I heard it from a couple different people whose opinions I respect online. And I heard, I, I kind of looked around a bit and the general consensus seemed to be that this is one of the best sci-fi series of the last decade or 20 years or something. Like, it's has incredibly high acclaim. So I just randomly picked it up and just started reading it. And so if you haven't read The Three-Body Problem, I would say, you know, you could continue on with this podcast. We'll talk without spoilers for a little bit but the vast majority of this is we're going to be going in depth about the story and and the themes and everything and if you are interested i would recommend just reading it cold like don't even read the description online or don't read the back of the the back of the book gives away stuff that like happens halfway through the book no matter how much you know about it you're going to enjoy it but if if we can start with conclusions my conclusion is go read this book don't learn anything else about it right now yeah it's the best sci-fi i can remember reading in a very long time and that includes me recently reading the foundation series so it's really really good yeah and um if you like science fiction then there's there's not even a hesitation i i'm I'm interested and maybe we'll talk about this as we go on people who aren't into science fiction i know amber your Amber Mark um, mm-hmm. read it. I, I don't know that she's a huge science fiction buff. Uh, um, no, I think I know she likes Ender's Game, that series. I don't know what other science fiction she's read. I don't think she's read. I think she's read iRobot, maybe, because we have a copy here. She, yeah, I, I think she my, read that, uh, my th- rendezvous with Rama yeah. years ago that I read. Yeah, my, su- my suspicion is that even if you don't read science fiction, this is an it's it'd be a great read and you know if if you like physics and the normal science fiction things uh you certainly will like it but Mm -hmm. i think that it it's uh worth reading even if you have never read science fiction so anyway that that was one of my conclusions get that out of the way before we start talking about the story i don't know it is i would say certainly if not hard science fiction very close to hard science fiction so if you have no interest at all in science stuff at all then maybe you wouldn't like it but it's certainly not technical it's not overly technical it's like i don't know if you think random physics discoveries are cool you're gonna love all the crazy stuff that can that happens in here i don't know yeah they try to give actually can we jump in and just start talking about that mark sure about Um, the physics the yeah, yeah. So um, I studied physics in college and certainly had kind of a educational basis to understand 
all of the physics-y fiction in this book, which there is plenty. Mm-hmm. But my my feeling was that it was all presented in kind of a dry, matter-of-fact way that it was awesome, but also didn't require much of me as the reader. No, how did you how did you feel about that, Mark? Because like my physics my physics knowledge is you know, high school level, basically, and then just, like, pop culture physics stuff, you know, Carl Sagan level, you know, educational level stuff. And I thought it was presented very clearly. Like, it was it was presented very cleanly and in, in, in a contextual way that you would understand, even if you really didn't know much at all about this actual science behind it. Yeah, I don't think there's a barrier there. It's just if, if for some reason, you're that doesn't interest you at all, then... Stay away, but it should interest you. It's really cool. But that's not to say it's a series that relies on tons of technological stuff. I think from a sociological perspective, it's also very interesting. As as most good science fiction, or you might argue all good science fiction does, it's more of a way to look at humanity than it is a way to look at uh, technology or the future, right? It's, it's very, science fiction... Good science fiction is always very reflective, right? It puts people in contexts, in technological or planetary or future contexts that allow the author to comment on where humans are right now. Sometimes more explicitly, sometimes less explicitly, but I think the Three Body Problem series does that well also. And oftentimes from a very broad perspective. So sometimes science fiction will be very personal. This one I think it's less personal and much more sociological in commenting on It definitely groups. varies, though. Like, yeah, it, do, it does There's vary. different points that are very personal, and then there's other points that are extremely broad perspective. Mm-hmm. The other kind of big part of this was that it was written by a Chinese author, and so there are some probably uh, cultural motifs, maybe, is the way of describing it, mm-hmm. or, kind, or, or also just the writing style that you might get more out of if you're more aware of that, <laughs> which we are not. And we yes. all read the translated version and loved it. And I'm sure there is something lost in translation, but yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I, I think in some ways there is other things, you know, we have a very cursory understanding of Chinese culture, but someone who is actually Chinese would, would get a lot more details out of this. But I think yeah, we certainly. Still but but also the, some I mean, things. The book it. contains a lot of the history that is important for mm-hmm. this story. Yeah, I, and and just my cursory knowledge of modern, or uh, I guess more further back than modern. But my cursory knowledge of world history was plenty to understand what was going on based on what was said in the book. I guess all of that to say that it is hard science fiction. Although I guess we could argue about that later. Um, that, if it's hard or of, soft, it's, it's kind of a fuzzy it's not, line. It's not fantasy Star Wars space opera science fiction it's, by any means. It's, it's much more in line with. It's probably hard science fiction. They give at least plausible explanations for pretty much all the science. Yeah. And for those who don't know, the the distinction that I've always heard between what's called hard science fiction and soft science fiction is that hard science fiction keeps technology and science within theoretically possible parameters. For instance, the example that I always hear is that in hard science fiction, you would never have faster than light travel. I've also yeah. heard definitions that say soft science fiction is more to do with the soft sciences as opposed to you know things like sociology or psychology or things like hmm. that as opposed to physics, math, chemistry. Maybe, whatever. yeah, that could be. The you classic know, soft I, sci-fi is Star Trek, right? And that's much more philosophical, sociological. Yeah, some parts of Star Trek try to be within theoretical possibilities, but that's not really the main uh, right, it's, driving force of it. Yeah, Star Trek's yeah. much more of like morality. Star Trek is closer almost to like Westerns in some senses. Yeah. Like morality plays. Anyways, should we get into Spoilerville? Let's do it. Sure. And, and we're going to do this book by book. Yes. Yeah, so, so this one's going to be about the first book called The Three-Body Problem. Technically, the series is called Remembrance of Earth's Past. But apparently everyone calls it the Three Body Problem series, named after the first book. Anyways, this one we're going to be talking specifically about the first book, The Three Body Problem. Let's go into it. So, uh, one thing to note, the Three Body Problem is a concept in physics that the book does touch on. 
And I found it very interesting to read up on what that was before I read the book. It's a it's a movement problem, essentially. It, it's right? the idea that and, and they talk about this in the book, but a, yeah. a one body system in terms of like a gravitational system would just be static and boring. A two body system would quickly fall into a very cyclic pattern mm-hmm. um, of some sort of rotation. But a three body problem where there are three masses moving around is apparently completely unpredictable or uncalculable. Chaotic. Chaotic. <laughs> and so that you you can't predict the future based on the past. Yeah. And, you, and it's too complex. I mean, it's the chaos theory thing of tiny, unmeasurable differences in position cause exponential differences in outcome. Yeah. So you can't calculate you can't say you know in 20 years it's going to look like this right and i know it's something that's been studied both in the planetary context which is where this book takes it and on the molecular level right matt um i'm not super aware of that i'm more familiar as just kind of like a mathematical problem which would be like newtonian physics Mm -hmm. and then there's also the general relativity based three body problem and the two are very similar in concept just there's a lot more math i think in the Mm -hmm. second and with as with all three of the books the title is really kind of is certainly a hint at something very important that you don't quite understand until at least midway through the book. I mean, we'll get, especially the the second book, Dark Forest, you get to Death's End is the last one. You can kind of see where that's going, um, just not the route it's taking, because that's more straightforward. But you don't really get to the three-body problem proper till at least a third of the way through the book and then you don't even quite understand it till maybe the halfway point um, yeah. which i find interesting that he does kind of tease the reader that way with his book titles and, and then in the last book of course with the prologue which doesn't make which i didn't even completely understand until even after finishing the book till you guys told explained it to me yeah uh, the, the prologue is pretty is just you read it and you're like what did i just read yeah this makes no sense and then you read like the chronology page at the beginning of that book (laughs) and you're like wow uh all right this is going to be a little more expansive than the previous yeah we'll get to that later the three body problem also starts with a prologue of sorts i don't know if it's labeled as such but it starts in the midst of china's cultural revolution in the 60s right 60s i forget the decade but we're screwing this up uh, 60s, I think, and it shows a basically a crackdown on science, among other things, on, on physicists. Uh, one, one thing I'd just like to note is kind of an overarching theme is the the way people think about, like, the, the relationship between cultural and society, or humanity even, and science, I think is one of the core themes that goes back and forth throughout the entire book and you see a lot of different feelings towards science (laughs) from three different perspectives right from the debates and the discussions and the differing values that the scientists have which is certainly important in the first book and there are a lot of main character scientists in this yeah uh you have the relationship between the cutting edge scientists and the government which is as in real life often the government trying to use them as a tool. And then, of course, the interest or ambivalence of the culture at large to what's going on on that level. Yeah. But in the opening, during the Cultural Revolution, essentially you have a crackdown on these two physicists or physicist uh, professors because they were not establishing with kind of the communist... Reactionary. Yeah. They They were being reactionary. Reactionary. (laughs) And they're killed and... It I then, think one of them is the father of the main character. Well, yes. not the main character, but the one of the main characters of the three. Body. Certainly, the most significant character of yeah. the books, <laughs> given what right. she does. Yeah, in that kind of, it's almost a tonal introduction to the story. I I don't know enough about the Cultural Revolution to say more than that, but it feels to me as as a Western observer to be kind of a tonal thing of setting up. Uh, science in conflict and on a character level trying to explain why Yi Wenji ends up doing what she does. 
Right. Who's the main character for the first part of the book. And they keep flashing back to what she does after the Cultural Revolution. She essentially gets captured and then gets a job within the military. She's kind of sent to a labor camp. And yeah, then eventually then she goes to this observatory, this yeah. like military observatory. Flash forward to more or less present time. And you have one of my favorite scenes still from any of the books, which is the pool table scene. Oh, yeah. Um, that was a really which cool Which is a really interesting explaining. part where it's set up almost as this like murder mystery at first because the one character whose name is escaping me at the moment. Wang Miao. Okay. Um, I won't get any of the pronunciations right, but. Yeah, apologies <laughs> for our pronunciations. I do my best. Yeah, so he he is kind of put on a commission or at least sent to observe uh, the scientists that keep committing suicide. And try to figure out what on earth is going on there. At some point pretty early on, he gets pulled over to this other character's house. And he the character tries to demonstrate why these scientists are uh, so distraught. And he uses a pool table as an example. And he says, you know, you push the pool, the pool ball hits another ball. Based on, based on the angles and the momentum and everything, it reacts in a predictable way. Now assume that I did that and... It phased through the other ball, or well, it then, bounced the then, other direction. Then he asks, like, "Oh yeah, yeah." If you if I did that same experiment in five minutes from now, would you expect the same result? And of course, you say yes. And if you if I did the same experiment, you know, <laughs> very simple experiment on a different pool table, or at the other end of this pool table, or at a different point in the room, you would expect the same result. And then he says, <laughs> "But." we're not seeing that and yeah, it's like basically physics fundamental is, physics results are just no longer reliable completely unpredictable and, they, and no one knows why yeah you also run into the policeman dashi yeah yeah and uh you kind of get the sense that there's some big government conspiracy going on but you really have no idea what what the deal is yeah and that's one of the first i think that scene stands out to me because that is if I remember correctly, at least in the chronology of, of the narrative, is that's the first scene where the scope is kind of pulled back a bit. Because mm -hmm. you have this stuff in the beginning, you don't quite know why that's going on. You hear, oh, there's these, these all these scientists keep killing themselves, uh, and we don't know why something weird's happening, and it's almost this, like, investigation thing, and then it's like, oh, damn, physics has stopped working. And you're like, well, that's odd yeah and there's all kind of secrecy around this and um but it's it's something that keeps repeating itself throughout the whole series is that the scope of the story pulls back to at yeah a, at it, an almost exponential level yeah in in just in mm -hmm. in terms of science fiction this was something new to me like a story that deals very straightforwardly with the idea of what if the scientific method stopped working. You know, right. what if the most fundamental things that we think we know... Cause and effect. <laughs> cause and effect are just thrown out the window. Yeah. And as we get into this story, the modern day story, a couple chapters in, the way that that unravels, and, and, and you see it from this one nanoparticles researcher, his perspective, um, as, as he uncovers this this great secret that physics has stopped working. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see how, you know, the government is dealing with it, how scientists are dealing with it. Um, and then ultimately as the questions start being asked, like, so now what, you know, where do we go from here? That was kind of, I, I, I don't know of any other fiction that deals with that. Certainly not in a hard science kind of way. I mean, I don't have a ton of science fiction. Uh, yeah. Same, reading same. done. In high school, I read a lot of Ray Bradbury, a ton of his short stories, and I read a fair amount of Asimov, and I never really, I never got into Clark or Heinlein. It was, I always wanted to, but I basically stopped reading fiction for a good amount of time. And that's one thing, well, um, I don't think we're going to go through the whole book kind of in order <laughs> how, how it goes, but <laughs> right. just, just, you know, to talk about three body as a whole, like the questions that get, get asked are of that scale. It's just mammoth and it in this first book the three body problem you know most of it takes place on earth scientists doing normal scientist things 
mm-hmm. uh, in a lot of regard. Like it looks a lot like Earth, maybe plus ten years from where we are now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But these questions of like basically the, the most fundamental things of things that we think we know um, are being challenged. I believe right after the pool table scene, we get to my second favorite, not my second favorite, but my second scene I want to highlight, which is the countdown. Yeah. Which yeah. is brilliantly written. Uh, just absolutely. brilliantly written. It's like he's trying to do science Ooh. and he just, there's no order to it. Yeah, and, and so the, he goes well, out and well, goes no. to take no, no, pictures, no, 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 no. right? No, our main character, Wang Miao, is the nanoparticle researcher, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so he suddenly sees a countdown appear before his eyes. Well, he no, sees it in his he pictures. sees it in his pictures first. Remember? It, oh yes, in the pictures. He's distraught by all this. Oh, oh yes, and film. it's yeah. and then Sorry. he develops his uh, film and sees it in the film, and yeah, he just yeah. sees a I, number. And I'm, then I'm he has his wife and you, kid. Mark, but let me echo: it's beautifully written. Yeah, <laughs> he has his wife and kid take pictures, and theirs don't do that. Yeah. Only his. So he and then I think it's the next like, morning he wakes up and it appears before his eyes. Yeah, in it, his it just, yeah. Just to call back to what I was saying earlier, you get this beautiful like everyday scientific method. It's like the thing that you would do if yeah, it's if, so if, if you if you did something and it didn't work the way that you thought you did, you try it again. And then if it didn't work again, you'd ha- you'd have your wife try it. <laughs> right. It, it's so not the, like, movie reaction <laughs> that right. you it's expect like, yeah. Something hero weird of... happens with a camera. So you try a different camera, and then you have someone else try that camera. Yeah, you start and... changing variables. Right. right. It's very... But yeah. it, in this beautiful everyday scene, you're seeing science itself fall apart. <laughs> yeah. And eventually he figures out that it's a countdown just appearing before his vision. And then that's when he gets invited to the three-body problem game, I believe. Sounds about right. Around there. And there we get to kind of the the title of the book and what ostensibly the story is about, although it ends up being less significant than you think. And I think is actually one of the least interesting parts of the book is the actual computer simulation. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would say that, Mark. It's certainly the least important to the plot, but I think there's kind of a thematic parallel that's done in an interesting way in this virtual reality kind of side story that keeps popping up. Yeah, there's something going on there. And it's certainly, again, a literary theme that keeps popping up is that certain things will be much, much more or much, much less important than they seem later on. Yeah. And as you're reading, you're and like, this is th- one of this them. has to be the mystery. Like this is this is something is going on here. And it, it, it ends is, up being almost completely inconsequential by the end. Of yeah. The book, let me. Yeah. At all. <laughs> I guess we're still trying that. to not think... spoil, but we we're in Spoilerville, so. Oh, yeah, we're deep in spoiler bill. I mean, it ends up... Okay, for people who are listening who are committed to the spoilers, the countdown and the failure in physics ends up being uh, because an alien race from a fairly near star sent tiny nano... Supercomputer so protons. Yeah, basically they folded a computer interdimensionally to these tiny little photons, and they started... S- just screwing up our science just so we wouldn't advance because they're invading us because it'll take yeah you know generations to get here 400 they didn't years. want our science to catch up to their fleet yes and the game is literally like a pr stunt yeah <laughs> which i think is hilarious when you finally learn it's like oh the aliens were trying to like explain their situation to earth people through this like mmo well well it, it's it's a little it, i think it's a little more straightforward than that mark there's the eto i forget what it stands for but there's there's this there's an organization of earth people who want to help the aliens yeah i mean the game is somewhat successful yeah but it, it how how is you as a secret organization how do you recruit people into your organization who are willing um, to betray the human race basically yeah Basically, they present the problem of this three-star alien world mm-hmm. in a VR game, and it's it's a it's a recruitment tool. Yeah, I mean, it still seems I still find it a bit humorous that it's just like oh, a yeah. VR recruitment tool. And yeah, they because have all, like, the, the whole weird... idea of the aliens is that they are literally in a three-body problem system. 
yeah. where there are three stars and one of them could just crash into their planet at any time and there's no way they can figure it out. And they have the ordered and chaos. So like sometimes all the stars are far away and the planet freezes and sometimes they're too close and the planet burns up and then eventually they will fall into a sun eventually mm-hmm. um, and, you know, just be died. So they're very much dealing with this unpredictable, destructive environment as, mm-hmm. a, as a race and are looking for a way out. And they find a way out by invading Earth. <laughs> yeah. My favorite part about this book, and this is why I say this book has the best mystery, because like you mentioned with the, the, the titles, you don't really know what's going to happen in any of the books. And he conceals it for a while. But I think this one, I say this one has the best mystery because as it unfolds, you, we've talked about this, like physics is failing. There's kind of a secret government thing going on. There's kind of a war on science. Someone is murdered. The scientists are committing suicide. You don't know what's going on. And you're like, it has to be aliens, right? If this is a sci-fi book, it has to be aliens. And then you're, and then the next chapter goes, and you're like, surely not. Nope, it's it's something else. I don't know. I'll just figure it out. And that cycle repeats, at least for me, a good three or four times throughout oh, the, really? the book. Oh, really? Basically, every time you get another chapter with the Yi Yi Wenji, or mm-hmm. is that her name? Yeah. You're like, oh, okay, it's aliens for sure. And then you're like, no, oh, no, it wasn't. Okay, I, I was. Uh, I yeah. was wrong. All right. Now, what what is it? And then at the end, you're like, of course, it was aliens. Like, it was aliens the whole time. It was aliens the whole time. It was right in front of you. It was the only explanation. I don't know. I thought he did a great job of kind of teasing you back and forth until you're like, well, duh. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go yeah. back and forth so much as I thought for a good long time, I thought that it was really going to get into fundamental physics just being incorrect mm-hmm. by not necessarily by because of intelligent screwing it up. But that all of a sudden something fundamental in the universe shifted and mm-hmm. and we were, you know, something was gonna fall out from that. And then eventually it kind of slowly, you know, you slowly start to learn, oh, okay, it's it's aliens. <laughs> right, because she goes to the the observatory and then you get the chapter where they're you're like, Oh, maybe it maybe it's aliens and then yeah. they're like, No, 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 it's this spy satellite thing and you're like, Oh, okay, it must be something else. Yeah. And then you get the chapter where they're like, No, it's the secret Chinese version of uh, SETI. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, it is aliens. And then she's like, no, we failed. And you're like, oh, it's not aliens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's what it was for me. Maybe not. Yeah, it wasn't so people, much as a roller coaster. Maybe other for people me. saw through this. But I had had it spoiled that it was, in fact, aliens. So I, I didn't have that roller coaster experience. But I think what I think is one of the great strengths of the series, and especially the first book, is that all these science fiction uh, tropes. And all these science fiction ideas are presented so kind of matter of fact and almost ancillary to this story. Like the fact that physics is just wrong now just kind of is what it is. And eventually, you know, the main uh, character, Wang Mao, kind of goes crazy trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's just it's just broken and kind of the world is kind of going on there's all this hinting that it is aliens that's behind this Mm -hmm. but but you get so little of the aliens in this book for you know for an alien story there are precious little alien moments well it's 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 very realistic about the time it takes them to travel the time it takes for any communications to happen Exactly. Right. The only thing yeah. that's outside, yeah. like a very conservative frame of reference, are the cell phones. Yeah, in in there are these overarching themes, but every end doesn't tie together in the way that, like, um, like a Lord of the Rings story, every end seems to to, to tie together, and the narrative, mm, yeah, you know, has just. A, uh, a narrative arc, a very intentional narrative arc. This is a book that's written, I mean, the chapters bounce around but from to different periods in time, and then you're spending time in virtual reality. I don't think the narrative arc has that same cohesiveness. There is a, a thematic cohesiveness, but uh, it's almost like all these things are, all the, all the crazy things that happening that are happening are so much bigger than the actual story being told. That, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how to finish that sentence. Yeah, but I mean, well, 
like maybe I said, you it's, can it's go the from there. pulling the pulling of the rug out, right? It's it's things being bigger, like more important or less important than they initially seem, and it's paralleled in the narrative by humans as a people constantly underestimating the odds that they're against over and over and over again, which, you know, I guess is kind of a classic commentary on people is that were super scrappy in sci-fi and in fantasy contexts. Which is actually kind of the way the book ends. <laughs> yeah. The curtain pulls back, they get all the intel from Trisolaris, and they're like, oh, wow, we're just, we're screwed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're coming in 400 years and we can't advance fundamental science. Yeah. Because we cannot, we literally cannot trust any results that we get. Any, all particle science is going to be unreliable. The, the idea was that they sent the, the Sophons to put a seal on mm -hmm. Earth science and basically say, you can't make any fundamental breakthroughs on the nature of matter or particle physics or anything like that. And sure, you can make slightly faster computers and you can make more efficient airplanes, but you can't, you know, unfold dimensions and you can't do the make something like the droplet or mm -hmm. you just can't deal with that level of technology. Yeah. A couple other interesting scenes. The human computer was cool in the <laughs> in the, the, the VR flag von Neumann machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they made like a a computer but all the gates were people with flags <laughs> which in, in the VR game which was kind of a, just an interesting it was a little side ridiculous, scene it was but silly it was, but it was quite a it was quite a scene for sure it was something i don't know i can't quite remember what its significance was but i thought it was yeah, a that, really cool that scene yeah that whole storyline they, they were trying to make a computational uh, solution for the three body problem oh right yeah 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 as a reader i kind of felt like we're trying to figure out how this other civilization lives. And, and you're not sure exactly what that other civilization is at first. Yeah. But so there's a mystery of figuring it out. But then also you're kind of tracing the de development of human culture and knowledge. Yeah. Where you kind of had, you know, you start with different different ways of thinking. And, and in the first kind of iterations, you have basically magicians trying to divine how the stars are going to move and then you have this development towards computers uh with the human computer that you're talking about so you kind of have a, a parallel history of knowledge what i thought was one of the coolest bits of the book certainly i'd say certainly the most cinematic part of the book is the nanowire attack at the end so in the story basically we find out about the aliens being contacted essentially UNG was basically just decided to betray humanity they got contact from the aliens and then at a point in the future she well she based sent, on she sent an initial transmission yeah yeah by she bouncing out this it way off to the amplify sun. through yeah. the sun a hundred million times so that the signal would actually reach other um you know, other systems, mm -hmm. and then they reply four years later, so she gets it eight years later and immediately sends her as a response, telling the other race that, well, we're four light years away, which means we're at Earth. Yeah. Yeah, she basically sends them enough information Gives to away pinpoint the, the coordinate. Yeah. And then at that point, is it in the first book where they figure out the speed based mm -hmm. on the light trails or the dust no, that's trails the, that's later that's later they figure out the speed of them yeah but uh, they knew it was the, the first the book doesn't it end like, all we know about the aliens is that they're coming yeah yeah it's like i guess it's early on in the in the second book where we we find out it's yeah. 400 years yeah it, no i th no i think well they knew i think it we was do get 400, 400 years because in tristellaris said it was going to be 400 years oh okay and they yeah said because because that's another uh, another thing about these books and the first book is no exception, I think they're incredibly pessimistic <laughs> in a lot of ways. And one thing that drove that home for me is the way the book ends with this kind of cliffhanger. We know aliens are coming in 400 years. So it's just this incredible sense of dread yeah. for the entire planet, for all of humanity. <laughs> Yeah, by itself, it's it's a downer of a book. <laughs> One of the other kind of conversations they, that comes up a couple times is they kind of discuss the hypothetical response to humanity to learning that there is 
uh, intelligence out there and kind of in, in surviving first contact mm-hmm. and the different sort of psychological is the wrong word i guess sociological impacts that it would have on you know people <laughs> yeah it's also interestingly mirrored in the different factions of eto or the ones that split off so there's mm-hmm. the ones who there's a faction that changes their mind and they want to help humanity there's a faction that wants just just hopes to, to survive that just yeah the well, that wants to welcome them and then work together well and cooperate as best they can Sort of. <laughs> kind of. And then the third faction just is like given up on humanity. Yeah. There's the Adventists who say humanity is so screwed up, you should just come wipe us out. Mm-hmm. Then there's the Redemptionists or something that say, hey, they almost kind of worship the mm-hmm. Trisolarans. Yeah. Because they're this advanced race. And surely they've uh, figured out to how to be a moral society with being more advanced and everything and we can learn from them and maybe we can even help them solve the three body problem and then there's the survivalists who say hey maybe some of our descendants will survive and we'll just serve the aliens in hopes of that but eventually the information that we've that they've gotten about trisolaris is pinpointed it's on a ship that's traveling around in international waters trying to remain anonymous right it's this terrorist ship basically sailing around with a giant antenna on it, and there's some hard drives that they desperately need. <laughs> yes. And they don't know what information is on there, but they know information that they really need is on there. Yeah, so then they set up the trap, what, in Panama? Yeah. Yeah, in the Panama Canal, and I think it's it's crazy cinematic, and I cannot wait to see it translated to screen when they finish the miniseries. But they set up a nanowire net, invisible, because it's nanowire that the ship goes through killing everyone on board. Right. They set up at like every meter a nanowire that just slices the entire ship and everything inside it. Yeah. Which I know you two, I, like, was it you, Matt, who said you had the, that was the biggest technological issue you had? Or like the biggest stretch? This, this is the thing that I could not suspend my disbelief for. And there are, there are far crazier things as far as science is concerned in this book. Uh, But this is the one that felt to me like was just impossible. Like, I don't know. See, to me, it's fairly easy because it's like, oh, it's just a wire, but it's just super strong and thin. That's fine. (laughs) I I can imagine such a thing. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's easier to imagine, but like... The more you know, the wire were that thin, I I think it would break. Yeah, sure. But the idea of an incredible, completely silent, deadly, devastating attack like that on a ship passing through a canal is wild. And that's yeah. basically they get the it, information it was definitely and possible find by out like that we're doomed. Science fiction terms. It's just that this series is insanely plausible. Yeah. Well, I think that's everything we wanted to talk about with the three body problem. We'll be back in two weeks talking about the second book in the series, The Dark Forest. Uh, don't forget to check out the website, thethoughtfulgamer.com. Uh, not really anything about books there, but we got lots of board game stuff. And don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to watch our main podcast being recorded live, get access to our Discord channel where we discuss board games and this book series, or at least have. Uh, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Any contribution will be greatly appreciated there. We'll talk to you again soon.